Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Michael Sinatra. I'm the director of the research uh, on digital communities based at University of Montreal. Um, it's a pleasure this morning to welcome as part of our speaker series, Matthew Battles from Harvard University, um, who is the associate director uh, of MetaLab, uh, where he develops designs, intervention, media provocations, and technology projects in collaboration with a wonderful team of architect, web designers, scholars, and artists. He's published several fascinating books uh, over the years, one of which is the Library, The Unquiet History, a great book on the history of palimpsest, and most recently, a book about trees in the Object uh, Collection series. Um, and his um, talk this morning is entitled Earth Measurer, Biodiversity, Effect, and Technology in the Midst of Mass Extension. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Battles. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you much for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and as Michael mentioned, uh, a lot of my own work has involved um, the cultural history of, of libraries and archives specifically, um, and collections more broadly. Uh, and, and this work uh, that I'm sharing today is, is rel a relatively new project for me, um, which, which strikes into different territory, um, uh, territory that includes collections. Um, natural History Museum collections specifically, um, uh, but also extends into other territories as well. I, I realized, um, I said to Michael this morning, that I never furnished an abstract, so that um, title that I've shared may seem a bit evocative and mysterious. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, museums and, and, and moths and machine learning um, and the kinds of, and I think Marcello's uh, book has really inspired me to think about these in terms of the kinds of authority um, that they uh, that that we create in them as apparatuses that that we contest within these um, within these forms of life within these craft practices and and modes of expertise um, and I'm going to do this in a bit of a, a of an unusual way um, I think I've, I've tried this a couple of times and I'm enjoying playing with a presentation mode that's a little bit different from a typical PowerPoint uh, because I'm sharing with you a number of different media um, rather than take pictures of those media and sort of cast them around as symbols. I'm, I'm just going to bring them up onto my desktop. So um, my kind of fumbling um, use of my desktop will be, I think, a, um, a, a set of habits that are familiar to everybody. Um, uh, but I, I hope you can be patient with this. I think it will make it easier to make the transitions from image to text to, um, to script um, as, I, as I proceed. Um, but, but to begin, um, I, I start with, uh, with this guy. Um, this is uh, William James. And uh, I, I mean, I've been fascinated with William James for a long time. Um, I wonder if I can change this, that's okay. Uh, it, but it was a specific quote uh, of James that arrested my attention last year. Um, in 1909, uh, James delivers a lecture uh, about, um, as was his want, about um, uh, our experience of experience. Um, and at some point in passing in that um, lecture, he says, uh, nature is but another name we give to excess. Um, and I found this a particularly arresting observation about the natural world in the first instance because um, we're living in a moment when the excess and abundance of nature um, doesn't seem as assured by any means as I think it did in James's time, right? That, um, and, and one sees this in um, literary and cultural productions of the sort of 19th century modernity um, of nature. Um, you know, Jules Verne in, in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea um, is constantly uh, examining the sea for its seemingly inexhaustible abundance. Um, the fish stream by without ever stopping. Um, uh, the, the crew of the Nautilus um, make decisions whether to destroy animals in the natural world based on um, sort of moral scales, um, never fearing that um, the choices they make might have consequences in terms of the abundance um, and ongoingness of uh, the ocean. Um, and indeed, you know, we know this from the history of of capitalism from the history of modernity, um, that the natural world has been taken as something that could be appropriated, something outside of um, a, a, the sort of cordon of, of human um, relations and concerns, something that we bring inside and transform in order to make it valuable. Um, and of course, we're living in a time now 
where that paradigm um, is very much still in force and yet very much called into question, right? Um, at the same time, uh, it struck me thinking about James's uh, equation of the natural world with excess, um, that this has become a, a rhetorical figure for understanding technology increasingly, right? Um, until quite recently, uh, our technological resources, uh, particularly computational resources, um, be it storage uh, uh, space for data uh, or computational speed or power, these were precious resources, right? We had to pay dearly for access to them. Um, when the personal computer first hit the market, it was very expensive um, and its capacities were dwarfed um, by, by what's available to us now. Um, particularly in the context of, um, you know, services which take a, as metaphorical um, framing um, uh, images from the natural world, um, cloud computing uh, and machine learning, um, uh, modeled on uh, neural networks. Um, we think now increasingly of computing resources as um, profuse, as um, uh, uh, unceasingly abundant, as available at our beck and call. Um, and I'm very interested in this, this paradox, this irony um, of the sudden abundance of computational and technological resources um, alongside um, the, the, uh, our sudden awareness, our belated awareness of the precarity of the natural world. Um, and, so, and so James's quote kind of ar arrested me in that sense um, and had me, thinking about, um, had me thinking about the forms that uh, abundance takes. And I'm going to try to size this now so that we can see it together. Um, and to think about the data, um, uh, uh, the discourse of data um, around abundance in the natural world as it's emerged from, you know, throughout modernity, from the time of Linnaeus forward. Um, I'm, and I'm using as a kind of, you know, figure for um, that diversity, taxonomy, um, the Linnaean system of uh, the names we give um, to creatures in the world, uh, to living things in the world, and uh, the ordered hierarchy uh, that we assign those names. And um, which it, it has become a way of organizing uh, our thinking about um, uh, abundance as biodiversity. Um, Darwin's good friend, J.B.S. Haldane, when asked what he thought evolution said about the mind of God, um, replied, well, he seems to have a fondness for beetles. And uh, there's so many kinds of them. And particularly in the study of insects, it has been biodiversity and the, and the profusion of form um, that has arrested the imagination, uh, the scientific imaginary and the cultural imaginary as well. Um, uh, throughout the modern era. And I, I want to look at this, this, um, this resource is the catalog of life, and it's a kind of meta database, a database of databases that brings together um, uh, uh, systems of the organization of biological knowledge across the biological sciences. Um, uh, and one of its um, interface elements is a browsable taxonomical tree. It gets updated regularly. This thing is a, is a fascinating in itself, a fascinating kind of document. Um, documental system, a fa fascinating network of networks um, of the craft practices of um, biological sciences. But I want to kind of dive into this just a little bit so that we get together a shared sense of um, how this abundance is figured and articulated um, in taxonomy. And this will be very reminiscent from, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, early year biology classes. Um, but if we look at the animal kingdom, animalia, um, we can go down into uh, the, um, we can find our way to the insects. Um, uh, in the Arthropoda, uh, where the Catalog of Life tells us they have cataloged a million eighty-one thousand five hundred twenty-four of an estimated 1.3 million um, living species. And the vast majority of those, it turns out, are insects. and. Here is the, um, the list of the orders of insects. Um, some of these names will be familiar, some of them much less so. Um, the order Lepidoptera is the butterflies and moths. Um, and I have a particular interest in the butterflies and moths. Um, uh, for, for some purposes of this talk, we could be talking about any of these, um, any of these orders, any of these families. But we're going to follow some stories of taxonomies in the butterflies and moths, uh, because they have some poetic resonances and because butterflies are beautiful. Um, but if we look a little farther down, let's see, I want to go to the superfamily um, Papilinoidea. Um, uh, 
which is a name derived from the Latin for butterfly, right? Uh, and we're going to look at this genus, and there are a lot of these genera. There are a lot of them. I mean, it's worth just meditating on how many of these there are. And each of these genera has um, perhaps two, perhaps 30 um, species uh, in it. I mean, um, this already is a, is a, um, a, a really um, uh, visible metric of abundance in the natural world. Um, but I'm looking for a particular um, genus, the genus uh, Lycaides. Let's see if I've gone past it. I have. Oh, and it's gone. Let me get my list so that I make sure I get this where I want it. Uh, Papilinoidea Lycaides. Oh, yes, it's with a Y. So we have here the genus of the she wolves. Um, I think the uh, you know the entomology the and, and etymology uh, uh, are are interestingly intertwined in taxonomy. The animism of these names is worth reflecting on, um, and and as we'll see later, that animism um, and that evocation of dead languages of of past forms of discourse uh, of place names and 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 names of people. Um, is, is richly intertwined um, in, in the discourses of science. And I'm interested in particular in this, in this um, species, Lycaides melissa. Um, uh, and, and I'll show you a picture of this organism um, in just a moment. Um, it's going to come up and it's going to be gigantic. So I'm going to make that a little smaller. This is Lycaides melissa samuelis. So um, uh, to invoke the the uh, the animism of this creature, um, the the she wolf bee uh, named after Samuel, and that Samuel happens to be Samuel Scudder, um, who was uh, an entomologist at at Harvard, and um, the scientific uh, mentor of this gentleman, uh, Vladimir Nabokov. Um, so Nabokov is famously um, not only um, a, a, a giant in the English literary world um, uh, uh, with, with a, a very kind of fraught and, and fascinating connection to language. But he was famously uh, an, an amateur entomologist as well. And at Harvard, um, where he spent the first part of his career in America, he worked not as, um, as, a, as a writer or, or a professor of literature, um, but as, a, as an entomologist in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. This is a story that has been very well told in, in a number of books. Um, and, and there are wonderful studies of the profusion of um, entomological and lepidopteral uh, citations, references, allusions in, in Nabokov's work. It's, it's a really rich um, topic, and I'm not going to dive too much into detail on that. I will share another picture of Nabokov um, uh, in, in entomological form. Um, I'll put him over here for a second. Uh, but what I'd like in particular um, to refer to about uh, Nabokov and his um, and his his work as a lepidopterist is how he uh, preserves for us um, uh, or instances for us some of the craft practices of figuring the abundance of the natural world as um, as as text as as word as collection. So Nabokov worked in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, he collected butterflies on his on his summer breaks, uh, and then he would dissect them um, to identify them um, by their um, by their sexual physiology, uh, by their reproductive parts, which was the, the classic way to, to undertake um, the identification of butterflies and moths um, in the mid 20th century. Um, these practices have changed a great deal because of um, the emergence of uh, genomics, of course. Uh, but it was principally a museological practice um, that created all of those names um, for, for insects, right? Uh, and it was people like Vladimir Nabokov um, in the museum, uh, dissecting insects uh, and and uh, identifying them, uh, that creates this enormous catalog, charting the diversity of the natural world. Um, and Nabokov wrote a, a, an intriguing poem about this activity, about this pastime of his um, that he saw as deadly serious. Um, first appeared in the New Yorker in 1943, and I like this poem so much because uh, Nabokov. Um, 
it depicts the 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 practice, the craft practice of of uh, of identifying and and uh, and putting these butterflies in collections, um, uh, and and the feeling of discovery that gives him, and what he thinks this, how he thinks this activity is situated um, in in the realm of um, uh, of of human knowledge and, and the human sciences. Um, I love this last uh, this last stanza. Um, where he sort of sketches what he thinks this act means um, and implicitly compares it to his own output uh, as, as a literateur. Dark pictures, thrones that pilgrim, uh, the stones that pilgrims kiss, poems that take a thousand years to die, but ape the immortality of this red label on a little butterfly. Um, and so here Nabokov is saying, this will outlast even perhaps my own literary work. Um, this, this, uh, uh, this creature in, in a museum. And um, I can, actually, we can look at that creature in a museum. Um, that's not the right one, but this one is. Here is, that's impossible to see. Uh, here's here's the guy that um, the Bokov found uh, as it is preserved as a, as a record image in the, uh, in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, this is a little butterfly that, that um, that Nabokov found. Uh, and here we have the red label um, that he mentions in the poem. The red label identifies it as, um, a, a, as a paratype, um, as, a, as, a, as a specimen that's identifying a new species. Uh, because indeed, this um, what at the time Nabokov identified as Plebeus Melissa Samuelis, the, the plowman bee named after Samuel Scudder. Um, Samuel Scudder's name is instanced here in this tiny little tag uh, here. And it was found near Albany. This is a new species that Vladimir Dabokov discovered, um, the Carner Blue, um, a, a butterfly that um, whose original range extends from Albany up into Quebec um, and through the Great Lakes region. Um, it, it thrives in sort of lupine barrens. Uh, it's quite a beautiful little butterfly when it's alive. Um, this, this, this one is rather desiccated by comparison, but it's been around for um, you know more than half a century now. Um, uh, the corner blue is quite rare um, in the U.S. and Canada now, largely as an uh, uh, as an effect of climate change, um, uh, because it, its um, its habitat is being sort of dismantled by a combination of habitat destruction and and climate change. Um, and so, you know, what I'm what intrigues me so much about this artifact is this is how um, you know the 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 work of uh, naming and figuring biological diversity in the context of modernity got done. I mean, these practices were the same practices that existed in William James's time in the early 20th century um, that had been um, institutionalized as um, a, a regime uh, of scientific authority um, uh, that was situated primarily in museums and primarily in collections. And each of those species names, you know, in uh, the catalog of life, that's not the right one, that's my email. Um, each of those species names in the catalog of life has, uh, or many of them, because this, this is a practice that's breaking up now um, as genomics um, uh, makes its advent. Uh, uh, but most of those species have at their origin um, uh, some little organism um, uh, desiccated in a, in, a, in a drawer somewhere, right? Um, and so I think it's it's worth our um, you know reflecting on uh, that as a craft practice, right? Um, and and how much this is changing now. Um, but I also want to step back before I get to the machine learning for just a moment to think about this 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 notion of of abundance uh, as as biodiversity, because I think in some ways um, in some ways. Both in in science and and in our kind of popular in amateur insect collecting, um, and in a variety of, of ways we have of interacting with insects, we've sort of, I think, um, mistaken one kind of abundance for another. Um, uh, biodiversity for sheer abundance, right? Um, I mean, even on the biodiversity um, front, um, there's much left that is a kind of dark abundance of mystery. Um, that we uh, don't know that science has not plumbed yet. Um, if you switch on a light uh, in the Amazon rainforest, um, something like two thirds of the insects that come to that light will not be on that catalog. 
Uh, they will not have been described um, to science. Now, they may have been described by others, and arguably those moths have names of their own that take the form of pheromones or um, certain kinds of sounds or uh, the mimicry of eye spots on wings. Um, but for the most part, um, biodiversity exists in an abundance, of what I call a dark abundance, um, a veiled um, realm of possibility beyond um, what scientific knowledge has, has encountered so far. Um, and I find this intriguing and, and troubling um, in the context of uh, how we've realized that a, a abundance now is, is, um, is figured in, in more dimensions than just biodiversity. There's been a great deal of um, interest in and concern about um, studies recently that have begun to show how the abundance of insects um, is, is declining. And uh, I think in a way, I mean, this is a matter for the history of science, but um, the, the practices of the description of biodiversity um, discounted abundance as, as a factor, discounted the sheer biomass um, of insects, which can be quite profound. Um, there's one more here. This uh, image is an amazing image to me. Um, so what you see here um, is weather radar uh, taken from the, the Mississippi River Valley, um, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and Missouri. Um, but this phenomenon is not weather. Uh, it's the emergence of mayflies from the Mississippi River and its tributaries. So this is like August. It's high summer. And the mayflies emerge in such abundance and such profusion um, that uh, they're visible on the weather radar. And um, this is also fascinating because this is an image from about a decade ago. And, and even mayflies, um, which, which are still doing quite well, they're not endangered or threatened. Um, but, but these phenomena that are captured on, on weather radar are fewer and farther between now than they were even a decade ago. Um, so abundance, um, in terms of the sheer amount of life um, figured here in terms of insects, is something that I think um, it, it, it's, it's arguable um, to say. Um, science, uh, the kind of paradigmatic science of, of biodiversity, ecology, and entomology kind of missed um, in the early 20th century. Uh, now, so I'm thinking about abundance particularly because, because I'm thinking about machine learning and computation again. And this is where I'm going to turn um, to machine learning. Uh, um, I've been thinking in particular in contrast to James's quote or in complement to James's quote, something that my friend and colleague at the Berkman Klein Center, David Weinberger, wrote last year in a Wired article about um, the advent of machine learning. Um, and David wrote that we're in a post-scarcity phase of computing. Um, uh, and furthermore, he wrote that about machine learning in particular, um, about the, the, the systems of algorithmic um, statistical inference and analysis um, that are quite charismatic in the discourse on technology right now, right? Um, that they, in David's argument, more closely model um, certain forms of natural phenomena. Um, and uh, others have argued that the, the sort of form these technologies take allows us to practice increasingly a kind of pre-theoretical or anti-theoretical um, science analysis, that we don't need to come up with hypotheses and test them that the machine will do that hypothesis um, formulation for us. And that the, the form that these algorithms take, the phenomena that um, these algorithms embody, um, are closer uh, to natural phenomena in certain crucial ways. Now, I'm not a, a endorsing that, um, that perspective. I, I think it's an ideological perspective that carries a lot of water for um, you know, commercial uh, uh, companies that, that are, are um, implementing algorithms um, in our daily lives. Um, but, you know, the difference, the fact that we do see these things in this way is interesting and I think anthropologically interesting for us. Um, so what I've got here is, um, is a, a very simple Python script um, that I have borrowed from Andre Karpathy. Um, Andre Karpathy has been the head of data science at Uber, uh, but he's also a really um, useful uh, um, uh, discussant of and and, uh, and uh, uh, explainer of machine learning algorithms. And he makes a lot of uh, code available on his GitHub. I should say, by the way, that um, particularly because of the idiosyncratic way I'm presenting all of this, that I have a 
list of resources that I'll share with you, Michael, afterwards that you can share around if people are interested in following up on any of this. This uh, script itself comes from uh, Karpathy's GitHub repo. And I'm sure we've all thought a little bit about what machine learning is. This is not going to be a talk about the computer science behind machine learning, but this is a, I'll just say briefly, this is a recurrent neural network. Um, it, it essentially um, is meant to mimic how people think the brain works in certain respects, or it's the simple physiology of neurons works. Um, a series of, of, of steps, statistical inf inferential steps are defined. Um, you, you give the algorithm uh, a set of training data. And in this case, what the algorithm is trying to do is um, predict uh, what the next character in line in that data set is. So you give it a string of characters, basically. Um, and, it, and it tries to extend that string of characters according to the patterns that it discovers in, in statistically inferentially in the training set. So what I'm doing with this um, very simple uh, machine learning algorithm is I'm using uh, for a training data set uh, the, the names of the genera of um, another kind of moth, um, which I'll share with you really quickly. Um, uh, as soon as I find it, little guy, here he is. Um, this is not the Carner Blue. This is Operophora brumata, um, uh, known also as the winter moth, a much kind of shabbier drab moth compared to the Carner Blue, um, but an intriguing one that, that also um, lives in regions that we share from New England um, into the maritime provinces. Uh, and it's, in fact, an invasive species, unlike the Carner Blue. Uh, it's a species that came from Europe. It seems to have arrived in Nova Scotia in the 1930s. Um, it turns out, although it wasn't understood at the time because Nova Scotia was warming and uh, as its climate became more like continental Europe, um, this, this, uh, this very um, discreet uh, organism found its way across the Atlantic. Um, and it was sequestered there in Nova Scotia until um, the early 21st century when it began to spread south uh, because essentially the, the continental climate um, interior from, from Maine up to New Brunswick made a wall of cold air that kept the, uh, the, the winter moth, as it's called, um, from making its way into um, southern regions. But now it's, 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 it's come south. It's as far south as, as New York State. Um, I'm intrigued by this organism because the winter moth is named thus because it, it, it um, emerges into adulthood in the winter. Uh, and so we've been treated to these kind of unreal um, uh, uncanny uh, eruptions of these gray moths fluttering in snowy woods um, throughout New England for the last um, 20 years or so. It's a very strange thing to see. I also like um, this this creature, um, Operophora brumata, because it's part of, part of a different family of the butterflies and moths called the Geometridae, a name that I really like, um, deriving from geometer or earth measurer. These are the loopers or the, or the inchworms, as we call them in English, the little green commas that you see um, uh, sort of descending from the trees on silk in the spring. Um, and this one is a, is, a, is a pretty serious pest of, of agriculture. Um, and, and so uh, to get back to my uh, machine learning, I've taken these, uh, the, the names of the geometridae, uh, the, the genuses uh, in, this, in this family of, of moths. There are about 2,000 of these. Um, so it's not a giant data set by machine learning terms, but it's, it's pretty substantial. Um, and I'm going to put a few of these guys away. So I'm going to run, I'll run the, um, the machine learning uh, for us now, the, the, the script, so that we can take a look at it together. And um, it's ready to go. So this is, the algorithm has been trained again on those names uh, of, of uh, the genera of the geometridae. And as you can see, it's beginning this output of um, trying to predict um, further down the line, what, what the, this um, training data wants to look like. Um, it prints to the screen, to the terminal, every 100 iterations. Um, and it computes this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this measure, which I think is kind of an evocatively named measure of loss, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of score of how well it's doing. The lower that figure, the, the closer it thinks it is um, to re recapitulating uh, the training data set. Um, and as you see, as this goes on, um, the names 
I call them names, but of course they're not names, are they? I mean, they're strings of characters um, that are produced by an algorithm that doesn't know what a moth or a butterfly is, doesn't know what evolution or natural selection is. Um, it doesn't know, you know what it smells like to turn soil over in the garden or what a flower looks like. Um, it doesn't know anything about evolution or taxonomy or Nabokov or the corner blue. Um, and yet it gives us these, these, what are they? These strings of characters, which we can enact as names um, which we can say, um, and they can be beautiful to say, Simenenia, that's nice, Somaius, Siopion. Um, and you see in this output, um, I think this output is like haunted um, by the passions of those collectors, those entomologists, um, those scientists uh, who were not as, uh, as expressive uh, literateurs as Nabokov, but were expressive through their adumbration of biodiversity in the world. Um, you see the sort of archaeology of this uh, uh, of this of this world, perhaps a lost world, a world that is is disappearing in a way. Um, and I'm not sure when I say it's disappearing whether I'm talking about the world of the museological entomologist or the world of the butterflies um, and the moths. Um, so I, I mean, I think about. Uh, a couple of things uh, sort of in, in conclusion here. Um, I want to say I started with um, I started with uh, uh, with a, a novelist um, who collected butterflies and I want to finish up with, um, with a poet who collected palm trees um, recently deceased um, uh, W.S. Merwin um, and this poem learning a dead language uh, which is one of his earlier poems. Uh, I think it was first anthologized in 1956, um, when Merwin was was traipsing around uh, the Limousin countryside, learning Occitan and uh, trying to find the traces of troubadours. Um, Merwin sketches the experience of uh, of trying to learn a language that's no longer spoken. Um, and again, it's the final stanza that really arrests me here, uh, where he writes, "To remember is not to rehearse." but to hear what never has fallen silence. So your learning is from the dead order and what sense of yourself is memorable. What passion may be heard when there is nothing for you to say. Um, I find this a nice evocation of what I see in this strange, um, this strange cascade of entities that look like names, right? Um, the, the, the kind of shards of, of passion um, of what passion may be heard when there's nothing for you to say. So Merwin's poem provokes thoughts for me on, on the nature of these names and their likely fate in any long durée we might envision. The algorithm's output is haunted by the passions of scientists, curators, collectors. We hear that passion in the resonance of the dead languages from which they're composed the syllables, the morphemes, like the broken parts of butterflies in the museum. We catch an echo of the dead's order, I want to say, disestablished uh, of Linnaean taxonomy as a kind of dead language. So there was a time when moths did not have names before Linnaeus came into view, or more properly, their names were expressed in moth ways. I mentioned this earlier, wing spot mimicry, the pheromones that they signal to each other with. And the moths and butterflies have had many other names besides the taxonomic orders as well, of course, common names in human languages, very few of them written down. Um, but I'm imagining there'll come a time when these names are no longer uttered, right? Um, when they no longer stand in ordered relations to the world in the way they seem to do now. A time when the wings fall from the pinned bodies collect in the corners of the cases in the museum and are consumed ultimately to dust. Will it take Nabokov's thousand years for this metamorphosis to take place? As Rosie Bre Bredotti has observed, uh, psychic constructs and ideas are as mortal, after all, and vulnerable as physical species. I imagine this algorithm running after we're gone, perhaps after the butterflies are gone too, this algorithm which doesn't know what a butterfly is, um, continuing to process that passion which versed in the rhythms of a dead language Nabokov invested in a specimen meant to last a thousand years, meant to last, outlast his poems. 
This algorithm seems to me to be chanting or singing the broken syllables of a world fallen silent, forms of order as fragmentary and ephemeral as the dead wings of moths. The algorithm is singing, singing like insects in the trees. And here I think of Yossi Parika, um, the media archeologist, um, whose wonderful book, Insect Media, charts um, uh, genealogical relationships between insects and invertebrates and the ways in which we've thought and instrumented our technologies um, throughout the history of modernity. Um, of course, these aren't names for butterflies and moths, are they? The neural network, as we've said already, um, as an apparatus, it doesn't, it doesn't express the requisite authority um, to make these names. Um, whatever the name is as a speech act, it hasn't yet come into being as such um, in this cascade falling down uh, the terminal window. Um, but it's astonishing to know how swiftly a kind of authority has been attributed to machine learning. Um, and I don't want to extend that authority to this algorithm as I'm implementing it here. I'm interested in using this algorithm expressively, not predictively or analytically. Um, we're talking at a time when the normative authority of the sciences to name and give accounts, an authority expressed partly in the catalog of life, right? But now, um, no longer so much in museological practice as gel electrophoresis and computational biology. Um, all of that authority has, despite its technical uh, sophistication, been called into question in the era of climate change. And it would be interesting, I think, to discuss this configuration of authorities further. Perhaps what I have done in this presentation, however, is to set up an authority of a kind, of a kind of trembling gossamer sort, um, which the algorithm expresses I want to argue not in connection so much with science, but with poetry and to the fashioning of a poetic response to experiences of the natural world. I want to claim this algorithm in short as a writing practice to weave it into that literary structure of authority. Even so, uh, saying that, I would prefer that that authority remain ephemeral and provisional, it remain performative. And if it's possible to break such authority with a speech act, I hereby do so now. Thank you very much. It's the first edition that I take the first question. Uh, so I, I, I try to do it. I, I heard that. I was prepared for that. Yes. So, uh, um, thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. I'm, I'm one, I, I have a million of, of uh, questions. And, um, the first one is uh, how what we are saying is reframing the relationships between uh, different entities which are not entities anymore. And I mean, mm. uh, human, uh, because you were playing with uh, we are there, we are no, yeah. uh, no, uh, no more there, or we weren't there, mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, butterflies, and uh, machine, and algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, po uh, poetry, and science. Uh, I mean, all these entities, uh, you are uh, showing something which uh, a situation where we cannot separate all this mm -hmm. stuff uh, as it was uh, self standing. Right. Um, so uh, the algorithm is making poetry, but it is making science too, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, he's human, he, he or she is human, yeah. the algorithm, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and we are not, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and he, <laughs> Yeah. is not human anymore. I mean, right. Uh, right. so it's a classification, yeah. a taxonomy, and so on. So I was wondering if uh, um, I'm reading a little bit, and uh, I sympathize with the uh, uh, post-human studies mm -hmm. uh, this period, mm -hmm. so what uh, uh, Carrie Wolf is doing, or uh, Rose Baidotti. Yeah. And uh, my question is about how do you think what you are proposing there can uh, have resonances with uh, with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I very much appreciate that perspective. And uh, I think, you know, my answer, I think, somewhat springs from um, my sort of concluding position that um, whatever authority I claim for this, um, this um, chaining together of, a, of, of the, the elements of um, a, a broad variety of discourses, um, which include word and image, which include science and poetry, uh, which include history um, in different flavors, and I would argue even philosophy. Uh, I think that this is something that is enacted in assemblage in 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 a moment that that is susceptible to 
reconfiguration in communities, that we create communities to discursively reconfigure these things. Um, and that ideally we find modes of discourse that allow us to, to do so in community with, with each other. Um, I think that, you know, Nabokov achieved great success in his life as a novelist and as a poet. Um, and his scientific achievements were um, denigrated in his lifetime by his peers. Um, uh, he was seen as a butterfly collector and a kind of, you know, it was a kind of odd passion that he had. That picture of Nabokov with the net was really meant to illustrate that, right? Um, and yet, you know, in a different configuration, um, Nabokov's poetry, and I think for himself, his poetry and his, and his scientific interests were not so far apart. Um, we're much more intimately intertwined with each other. I think too that in terms of how we relate to the natural world, this intimate <laughs> entanglement is something that many, many are 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 speaking to. Um, you know, from posthumanists to folks like Donna Haraway, uh, Anna Singh, and others to talk about the entanglement um, and the um, uh, the the being community that we already each are. Um, you know, and I showed that um, image of the swarm of insects, the mayfly swarm, um, to another to a group of students. Somebody pointed out that that's that's already a kind of organism. It's kind of a hyper object, a gigantic organism of its of its own. That's not so easily captured by the taxonomic ordering, um, but it's an organism that includes the Mississippi River Valley. It includes summer storms. It includes uh, trucks that plow the dead bodies of the mayflies off of bridges because they're so thickly settled on the bridges that you can't drive through otherwise. Um, and so I think that for me, you know, some of this kind of hybridization um, and symbiosis is, um, is called for uh, in a discursive address of these, these, these forms of, of knowledge, and ultimately um, the, the, the kind of authority that we think they, they have in the world. Um, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit more about poetry and its role in all of this, and also the intersections of like literary thought and scientific thought, and and how, in a way, like I'm thinking of of Nabokov's poem and and this poem by Merwin, neither of which I was familiar mm, with, but mm -hmm. they're both sort of capturing scientific yeah. ideas and realities in verse form, which mm -hmm. is odd, but they're also if I can, I mean, I'm not exactly sure, but they seem to be sort of fixed in terms of at least the, the stanza structure, the stanza yes. structure. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, in terms of, there's like enjambment there. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think the Nabokov poem rhymed either. So there's right. sort of a looseness. It's got, there's a, yeah, here I go back there. Okay. It's got, oh, it's actually got a rhyme so, scheme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm just, and in a way I find that disappointing because <laughs> you'd almost want like the poetic, um, the, the poetic rendition of, of taxonomy or scientific mm -hmm, ideas mm -hmm. to, to embrace the elu yeah. elusiveness more yeah. fully. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. um, and then, I don't know, I feel like I'm throwing out a bunch of maybe ideas that don't cohere completely, but Nabokov's concluding remarks about um, how you know, the museum version of the butterfly will outlive his own poem, which mm -hmm. I don't entirely believe. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Giant, it's like uh, but, retweets are not endorsements. And I, <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. <laughs> but I'm wondering, like, the wonderful ways in which, like, I think, like, literary thought and even that, like, the sort of creative algorithm that you've been exploring mm. captures these scientific mm -hmm. realities and what you call these flawed scientific paradigms, right? Like yeah. their inability to capture the abundance of biodiversity. Right. Um, I mean, obviously that's true, and I'm a literary person, so I believe <laughs> in the ability of literature to see all these things. <laughs> but how how is this of val value to like a scientific perspective? Right. And you know, Nabokov's friends laughing at his little yeah. hobby of collecting right. butterflies. Mm -hmm. Um how 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 can the two disciplines kind of speak to each other? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. And this isn't this the the, the classic sort of C.P. Snow two cultures problem that that has been, you know, the the kind of problematic of of um, the institutional sciences in you know in kind of hot, you know the post middle twentieth century modernity. I mean, this mm -hmm. this particular struggle, this agon of the sciences and and the humanities. Um, is one that bedevils us at every turn. And I think these poems are, are haunted by that. Um, 
these are both, I, you know, I mean, Nabokov was, was a poet, not as strong a poet as he was a novelist. Mm -hmm. um, this is an early Merwin poem. I think these are both minor works by, by these, these writers, which I deploy here mostly because as you, um, as you instance, they're mm -hmm. poems depicting this, a moment of a kind of scientific practice. Um, you know, philology in the case of, uh, and translation in the case of Merwin, and uh, the, the museological practice um, of the Comparative Zoology Museum in the case of Nabokov. And so they are, you know, and, you know, it's, it's those of you who know Merwin's work, um, the, 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 the metrical freedom, um, the, the, um, proximity to orality of his of his later work um, stands in really s distinct contrast um, to this much earlier poem, um, a poem that he's um, that he's writing at a time when he's engaged in a kind of deep communion with metrical forms that are themselves pre scientific that that you know date from the high Middle Ages, um, and so you know in Merwin's case he's evoking I think you know the the the, the, the song structures of the troubadours, um, which were quite elaborate in their stanzaic forms. Um, uh, but they're both very kind of mannered, um, uh, kind of, you know, workmanlike poems. They kind of churn through their stuff, you know, uh, with a lot of machinery. And so to your question of how, how we overcome that, how we look to the, 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 the possibilities of, of abundance that poetic form allows, I mean, I think the, um, I think I think the resources for that do abound, and I think increasingly the resources for that um, that advocation of uh, description of an encounter with um, the, the the suchness of the world um, that we associate with poetry are being understood as something that's been missing from the scientific description of the natural world. As I try to indicate early in the presentation, that museological approach to biodiversity missed the question of sheer abundance, missed the question of how much um, these organisms thrive. I've been reading a lot in moral philosophy recently about how, I've been reading about how moral philosophers encounter the question of animal rights. And of course, insects are largely out of that question. It's almost entirely, um, these, these discourses on rights are almost entirely based on individual organisms. And a number of philosophers from a pragmatic perspective or a utilitarian perspective like Peter Singer um, or folks in a Kantian perspective, they all agree that it's impossible from a philosophical perspective to see the species as an entity, that we can't think the species, we only think the individual. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the many things that poetry might help us do is, is think the species, think community, um, think assemblage. Um, one of the things I like about Yusuf Parika's work, um, the media archeologist, uh, Yusuf Parika in Insect Media, is that he talks a great deal about how technology um, gets figured throughout um, the 20th century, but particularly in the context of computation, um, in, in reference to or by transducing or translating um, biological forms of life and forms of organization that have to do with, with mass and abundance and, and with um, kind of molar, kind of large amounts of resources rather than thinking about the individual. Uh, and I think there's a rich vein of, of, um, of, of thinking and, and not only metaphor, but, but um, tools for thinking to work with there. I just want to pick up on this just because I, I think one way to respond to this question is to shift away from uh, uh, an analysis of contents mm -hmm. and descriptions, which are, which are really important for most scientific description, but um, to look at actual formal composition. Uh, and to think of poets like Jackson Niccolo, uh, who is essentially a natural historian of language, who like collects specimens of languages and, and, and composes through through uh, a, a highly scientific like practice mm -hmm. of, of collection and uh, redeploying language yeah, through, nice. through, through performances. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. And so in, in that sense, I think poetry has a lot to speak to in the sense of uh, yeah, like the, the formal modes of composition and, and recirculation of language. Yeah, and I mean, I think just one more beat on that that I, I, I'm really interested in. I don't feel like I've sorted it out yet. I think there are a lot of different ways to take it, but you know, to take this um, to take this algorithmic practice, um, this cascade of names as as a writing practice um, that's not finished, that's still kind of broken open, that 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 um, 
that that needs some further figuration is something that I'm interested in thinking further through. Um, I'm particularly intrigued through Parika again by the concept of metamorphosis. Um, I think a lot of our kind of media studies um, uh, tools for thinking with have have focused on um, you know on on the the, the the materiality in useful ways the materialities of media. Um, but thinking about how those materialities themselves are, are susceptible to change over time, um, mineralogical, geological, chemical. Um, I, I want to work with that that um, metamorphosis. I, I wanted to mention in connection with this question of metamorphosis, and I didn't, the work of, a, of an artist, a Taiwanese artist named Li Mingwei, who's um, striking me as somebody who's like, this particular project of, of Li's is one that I um, I'm inspired by, I want to emulate at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in 2017, as part of an installation of Soundworks, um, Lee created this piece called A Small Conversation, um, which is uh, um, an installation of, of small speakers in the courtyard garden in the Gardner Museum, which for those of you who visited there is a, is a kind of landmark um, uh, feature of this particular museum, a museum which is itself a, a, a kind of butterfly-like mimicry of a Venetian palazzo. Um, and the courtyard in the center of the museum is this bursting garden full of all kinds of objets d'art. And uh, one aspect of this garden that's crucial to understand is that because it's in proximity to art, they exterminate all the insects in that garden on a regular basis. They keep it free of insect life. And of course, these plants, they don't exist without insects in the world. They evolved alongside insects all the way down. Um, they're partners with insects and the crime of evolution, right? Um, and yet they can't have insects in the garden. So Lee created this installation of sounds of insects and and uh, populated the garden with these sounds and small speakers that are sort of hidden away. So you can sit in the garden and now hear the sounds of insects. But the thing that I find so interesting about Lee's work is that the sounds are not like field recordings of insects. They're his own mimicry um, of insects made orally um, that he then records. And he tells that um, as a child, he was aphasic, he spoke very late in his childhood and actually used the sounds of insects um, to communicate with his parents before he began to speak. And uh, um, I want to find a way to that from here. <laughs> We've got a ways to go. Yeah. I, I, I apologize, I missed the setup for your paper, I'm trying to find the room this morning, but um, I was really uh, interested in, in the analysis that you were doing of the uh, way in which the algorithm, as I understand it from your description, um, is fed, the, if I'm correct, is mm -hmm. fed the sort of the, the different um, uh, Latin names that have been used to classify right. the, the mod species that you're interested in. And, and then uh, based on that pattern, sort of mm -hmm. predict what might be um, uh, likely extensions of yeah. that classificatory yeah. system, and um, and the way in which those the the the, the names prior to the machine learning uh, version of the uh, extension of that practice um, reference mm -hmm. the the passions of the scientists right that. that yeah, um, are connected to the species, and and I can I can't help thinking about um, my own work has focused on sort of plant collectors mm. in, in in colonial regions, and um, um, build, drawing on work by uh, anthropologists like uh, Eric Mugler and mm -hmm. his book The Paper Road, and sort okay. of looking at how uh, the sort of the naming, the claiming, the discovery of these species, in fact, is really um, well, on one, it's doing one thing, it's extracting those species out of a context where they had other names right. and right. that were not necessarily systematized, as yeah. I'm sure you know. And, um, but also borrow the knowledge of the local communities that don't need to discover these species mm -hmm. and are aware that they're there, uh, but within a, a different system of, know, of knowledge. Um, and so in a way, the thing that, uh, I guess, I don't know if I should be worried about it. The thing that the machine learning uh, version of the classificatory naming system seems to do is extend that practice of, of like what Mary Louise Pratt has called anti-conquest, mm -hmm. 
or continue, or it seems to be potentially um, undo it. Yeah. By yeah. Ran, by kind of, it's not randomizing it, but it's pretty nearly it's decentering yeah. the human agency and mm -hmm. that the uh, and the authority. In mm -hmm. fact, it seems to me, and it's, yeah. I, I guess it could work both ways mm -hmm. because it doesn't. It's not. I don't see the names as so much haunted by the passion of the scientists, but actually um, more the. Yeah, for lack of a better mm -hmm. phrase, like the unearned authority mm -hmm. that uh, the, that naming yeah. practice yeah. Um, connects them with. And then, yeah. yeah, so I don't know what you think. About that. Oh, I think, I, I mean, I think you're right to worry about that. And I appreciate that point very much. And it, and it very much is, is, is in my mind. Um, I think, you know, one interesting aspect, uh, and I don't think that this resolves that question at all. Um, I think that that's, you know, it, an intensely problematic, um, aspect of the, the history of scientific description. I mean, and in, in uh, you know, another rendering of this presentation, I've, I've hit that nail more squarely on the head than I did today. Um, but in particular, the ways in which these practices of, of the description of organisms in the natural world were very much tied into that um, figuring of nature as endlessly abundant, um, while at the same time doing so by abstracting it from um, uh, the uh, extracting organisms and their relationships with each other from embedded, situated knowledges, um, and and rendering those um, uh, those communities as resources essentially to be appropriated. Um, I think that's very much part of the taxonomy, uh, the taxonomic system, and it very much haunts the system of taxonomy. I'm interested in the machine learning because, in part, it does. Um, disestablish that it maybe doesn't do so um uh with you know kind of sufficient precision or performativity um i mean it's because it isn't actually um this particular algorithm is not um recapitulating the ordering the classification system um it's treating that classification it's 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 stripping that classification system from this bag of words this bag of strings of characters it's reducing and reducing and reducing this to something that is, uh, you know, that, that is not legible to a human in a sense. So, I mean, you could write an algorithm which would, um, which would riff on that, that story of taxonomic ordering. Um, you could set up a series of rules for choosing some words from, you know, the little and short Latin dictionary from, um, you know, the American bureaus of ethnology um, from a, a dictionary of who's who and come up with these, funny hybrids, you could write, you know, a much shorter Python script to generate plausible names that would have some of that, um, that, 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 that um, hybridity of taxonomy in them. This is just treating them as, um, as brute statistical entities in the world. Um, and that renders them, I mean, you do see in the output um, artifacts of organization. I mean, they, they are in the catalog of life uh, at the genus level, um, they're no longer ordered taxonomically according to their um, uh, postulated evolutionary relationships with each other, but they're alphabetical. And the algorithm catches that alphabetical um, ordering um, in the strings that it comes up with. Um, and I do think that um, the sounds of, of, um, of, of dying languages and languages excluded from power and authority are also traceable um, are also haunting these um, syllables, these morphemes um, in the machine learning output as well. Um, I'm starting, just starting to think about ways to sort of re ramify um, this output um, and to use maybe some computational tools for doing so, some visualization tools for doing so. I mean, you can sort them into genealogies, um, you know, formally um, uh, in, in all kinds of different ways. And so playing with the kind of imminent, making imminent some implicit structure in this body of words might be a way um, uh, to, to uh, at least acknowledge um, the losses that, uh, that were incurred in this, in this um, construction of authority in the taxonomic system. I have, I have a question. Um, it's a question for you, but also for Marcelo, I guess. Um, um, looking at David J. Johnston, uh, uh, work is a Canadian poet mm. working a lot with. Uh, oh yeah, with uh, machine learning as well. Uh -huh. um, he does this performance where um, 
the text is generated from a train training corpus. I don't know which one. I don't remember. Okay. Uh huh. Um, in his in his performance, he uh, live edits what the computer has has written as an script. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the authority is interesting. The tension between uh, the human decision and uh, yeah. the machine writing is mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. and I was, so I was wondering what you what would you think about this uh, in terms of um, sharing this authority yeah. of the written world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marcello, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's a fascinating um, technique and intervention in, in the output. Um, and just now I'm beginning to think about the ways in which one might intervene performatively in this output. Um, and the, the possibilities are, are really fascinating to me. And I think the, the, the fundamental point to drive towards is the, the, the sort of the, the, the understanding of an assemblage and a community that one can forge with the algorithm as well as with creatures in the natural world that um, one becomes a complement to or um, a partner um, with this algorithmic entity in a kind of interesting way. I mean, uh, um, you know, Gary Kasparov has talked about this with respect to, um, you know, um, uh, machine uh, chess that um, he's argued that the most successful, um, you know, uh, machine chess is is in, is a centaur, as they call it, you know, a, a, an algorithm that partners with a human. Um, I'm not sure that that's proven true in um, in competitive chess play, but as a as a social, um, you know, as an instrumentalization of these technologies, I think trying to stay close to them, trying to stay close to them in a kind of minimal computing sense, um, is really crucial for a, a kind of ethical address of what these um, of the authority that these algorithms are being. Um, are being given in in the market and in policy and in politics. I mean, you know, these are, are algorithms, um, much more complex versions of the one that I'm using here that are being used in the US to, to sentence you know, criminals to jail. They're being used increasingly um, to search for drugs, um, to uh, complement diagnostic protocols in healthcare. Um, they're certainly being used to surveil us for surveillance capitalism purposes. And um, you know, a lot of that, you know, use of these algorithms is engendered by um, a construction of authority that, um, that, you know, asks us to, to trust them, to, to take for granted that um, they'll have our best interests at heart. And I think, you know, working closely, intimately with these algorithms, which we're told are black boxed, we can't understand um, fundamentally um, what, what's happening in the layers of neural, uh, the, the sort of layers of, of, of of so-called neurons um, that comprise them. Um, we can get a lot closer to that than I think um, we're often told we can. Um, but I also want to make sure that in, in, in addressing that, that I'm not eliding this question of, um, uh, you know, the many uh, webs and networks of, of authority, authority constructed and authority denied. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned not to make a kind of leap from um, you know, from Nabokov and uh, and the entomologists uh, locked away in the cabinets of the museum, out of sight of um, people, and the bare life of the natural world. Um, this this kind of discourse of um, you know the transcendent uh, Western uh, human subject uh, that looks down on nature from from above. Um, I think we can get closer to the algorithms. I think we can get closer to um, nature um, than that view. Yeah, uh, yeah perhaps just a comment. Yes, uh, um, I think it's it's the point of the challenge of uh, this separation of the boundaries between uh, between. Uh, I mean. Uh, Catherine Hayes uh, uh, wrote this book, uh, uh, How We uh, Became Post-Human. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, we should ask the question also how we became human. And in that case, mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the practice like uh, a way of defining uh, uh, ourselves so, as human. I, mean, I am human because I'm able to edit uh, the what the algorithm do. But uh, does but then uh, we, we could imagine an algorithm editing what you are doing and saying what is the the, uh, the best result. 
than uh, another uh, interaction. And I mean, uh, we, we are defining ourselves on the basis of, I mean, uh, um, neural networks are really interesting because they say something about uh, how we are. We are. Mm -hmm. we are using them to say, ah, this is how we work. Uh, yes. So it's, it's right. the model. We are. Uh, it's not the machine imitating us. We are imitating the machine. Right. right. Uh, so it's really interesting. There's not two poles, uh, and the same thing for the observation of nature. So mm -hmm. the, 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 they're not two uh, separated entities. Uh, uh, and then, and, and that's. I think it's the problem when we are uh, trying to to define what's going on online. We are always trying to separate. Okay, this is me. Uh, it's my intentionality. Mm -hmm. Yes, but your intentionality actually is, uh, is made of uh, hybrid stuff. And so if you are editing the algorithm, uh, this act has no meaning itself. It is integrated in, uh, in, uh, in a dynamic which is more, more complex. And uh, it, it is this dynamic that makes you emerge as a poet or as a human being or, or as an algorithm too. This, this would be my... So it, Nice. Nice. Good. Good. Um, I thank you so much for, for I mean, I'm, I'm so fascinated by the entire discussion here because for me, talking about algorithms and digital humanities is really absolutely new in, in a way. And so I'm not really first into this, mm -hmm. but some some of the keywords in a way struck a chord mm -hmm. with me just because um, maybe this is very naive, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking back a little bit and um, one of the thoughts butterflies in, in general are kind of um, a literary topics in, mm -hmm. in various ways. For sure. Also epistemologically, right? You're yeah. talking about you know, chaos theory, that what comes to mind is the wing of the butterfly, right? So yes. All of those kinds of things. So there 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 is already an overdetermination of the butterfly asking itself. Right? Yeah. In, in, yeah. in a way. And, and all of that when you talk about it comes with mm -hmm. it. One of the things also that, that came to my mind, the, um, also years and years past that I've read it that is um, Margaret Edwards' surf state, right, where the father uh -huh. is also an entomologist. Mm -hmm. And of course, he also incorporates or kind of uh, embodies the rule of the father, the language of the father, yes. symbolic act, et cetera. And so it's, it, he carries all that authority around empirical knowledge production and so forth. And then the female protagonist discovers, after the nurse and herself, in then still contact nature of some mm -hmm. sort of um, indigenous writing that mm -hmm. surfaced in, in the, the part of the geological strata mm -hmm. of, of the earth mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. so that's good it's really good yeah so if so and and, and, and it kind of recreates the understanding of earth altogether in, in a way yeah so you have that but then also at the same time i think when i look at the algorithm which is absolutely Kind of fascinating. I can see instant installations where you have layers and layers mm -hmm. of, of text that, that move and and so forth. But at the same time, what I also see is um, you know surrealist automatic writing. Yeah. And, yeah. And absolutely. It is as if as if the algorithm kind of um, performs that earlier mode of historical undoing of authority, mm -hmm. which was surrealist mm -hmm. automatic writing. Yeah. And, and in fact, in, interesting. I think. Margaret Edwards was in, in the Canadian context at the very beginning of her career, someone who actually entirely supported that notion of automatic. Yeah, writing. yeah. So yeah, I, I think there are kind of strange historical links. Yeah, that... no, that's wonderful to follow up on. I think. So I... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. I think it's really interesting to follow up on that, on the Atwood context in particular, and and of course, yeah, the the, the you know the 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 legacy of automatic writing and and surrealist practice. Um, and the cut up, and I mean, there, there were you know a whole series of um, 20th century avant-garde techniques for you know rendering um, literary production automatic or or um, stochastic in in certain ways, right? And um, and I think this certainly is in dialogue with that. And and um, you know one of the things that's striking about it is, and somebody who's um, working in a very sophisticated way with machine learning expressed this to me about the output of these algorithms that one thing that it can do is render um, uniqueness uh, decoupled from rarity. And I found that a really arresting observation that, um, and it's striking how, I mean, this has been running for, you know, half an hour. It can run it all day. And say that again. Uniqueness, decoupled uniqueness decoupled from rarity. Um, 
that these it's very hard to get this to recreate um, a, a string precisely. Um, I haven't found an instance, in fact. Um, and the ways in which that both is a kind of, um, you know, a kind of mirroring of the natural world and of the, the, um, the seeming inexhaustibility of biodiversity um, and almost a kind of travesty of that, knowing how fragile that world is, um, uh, is, is, is fascinating to meditate on. But, but, but it's also oppositional too. Like it's op op this is like directly oppositional to automatic writing because it's engineered. Yeah. It's anagrammatic uh, writing that 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 it takes takes a takes a case instance. Yeah. So it's, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so it's, 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 it's a good point. Like, it's like interesting. It's like um, there's no consciousness. It, right it, it, it's 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 reforming authority, uh, as you say, yeah. in, in an interesting yeah. way. But it's it's directly oppositional to. Uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in this question of authority and how and how authority bodies forth in these in these systems, um, and and how that authority is is instrumentalized in, in the market when we talk about the application of these tools um, uh, or in policy and these sorts of things. Um, it, it, it's it's um, it's it's a very distinctly different quarter, and as Marcello says, it, 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 we are using it to reconfigure our sense of what. Um, what the human is, what cognition is. Um, and I would argue not in a terribly interesting way, in a way that's like reductive and problematic in, in certain respects. Although I think the possibility is there, the possibility is imminent in, uh, in these tools um, for a much richer, um, much more humble, I think, um, uh, adumbration of, of uh, cognitive possibility. Well, please join me in thanking Matthew again for a very stimulating talk this morning. And uh, you're all um, invited to come up to the eighth floor in the space that uh, the uh, uh, DH Center shares.